will host the second Belt and Road Forum for International Cooperation in late April. With the extraordinary scale and the reach of the BRI, its commitment to the environment is sometimes questioned. But are its projects at odds with the worldwide commitment to carbon emission reduction? What are the best ways to ensure the initiative brings long-term, planet-friendly growth? And does China have what it takes to fulfill its commitment to climate goals? To discuss these issues and more, I'm very happy to be joined by Mark Watts, Executive Director of C40 Cities Climate Leadership Group, and Nico De Jager, Councillor and Member of the Mayoral Committee for Environment and Infrastructure Services of Johannesburg, South Africa. That's our topic. This is the Dialogue. I'm Yang Rei. Welcome to our discussion here on dialogue, gentlemen. The top concern for those observers, the Chinese and foreign alike at this moment, the head of the uh, BRI forum, the second of its kind, is environmental protection. China comes under fire at home and abroad for its export of overcapacity and the building of infrastructure, perhaps at the cost of local environmental conditions. What do you think of these widespread concerns? Are they justifiable? Well, I think there's definitely a justifiable concern in that 80% of the investment in fuel infrastructure uh, with Belt and Road Initiative is in fossil fuels, when we, we need to be having a dramatic shift to renewable energy. But the thing is, that, that's true of most international development aid until very, very, very recently. And I think it's a, it's a pressure on the entire world, world, all the multilateral banks, all of the national investments to shift decisively to renewable energy. That will be in the best interest of the Belt and Road Initiative. Because if you're investing in coal and gas now, you're, you're putting your assets at considerable risk because they're going to be stranded in a few years' time when the world really wakes up to the threat of climate change and, and realises those things have got to be shut down. Uh, what do you think of his concern on the use of fossil fuel that generates up to 85% of our power uh, capacity? It's absolutely, and I can use Johannesburg as a prime example where we have uh, some of the, the most fantastic sunlight opportunities and yet we're still reliant on fossil, we're still reliant on, on, on uh, coal to generate energy when we should be using renewables to do that. So it is about that balance that while you do develop, you should also have mitigation, mitigating factors in place to deal with, with the uh, with offset of, of what you are doing. But at the same time, um, we are one third of the wind power and one fifth mm -hmm. of the solar uh, energy. In that case, what do you think of, uh, say, the Chinese awareness of a green environment and a green energy, low carbon development at the same time? Well, that's one of the interesting things, because it, certainly China's investment in renewable energy is changing the entire world market. The reason now that in most parts of the world, there's pretty much price parity for renewable energy against the old forms of fossil fuel, and obviously with much lower costs to society o over time. And that's really been driven by investment in China. That doesn't seem to date to have translated into the Belt and Road Initiative, but you can see that the basis in policy in China is already there and is, is benefiting this country greatly one just no notices it coming back to Beijing after a year and, and breathing much cleaner air. So I think what I'd certainly like to see is the, the, in, the inventiveness that's gone into really shifting the Chinese economy on energy, on vehicles, the complete, you know, the world market on electric vehicles is becoming dominated by China quite rightly. Uh, I was talking to colleagues in Latin America the other day. There are now more electric buses on the road in South America than in North America, and every single one of them was manufactured in China. You know, that's a great testament to what this nation can do. You'd like to see those things translating into, into the Belt and Road Initiative. Of course, China uh, stands out as uh, a most important manufacturing center, uh, something that President Trump is not very happy about uh, over the charges of outsourcing the um, American jobs, allegedly. Having said this, uh, uh, what do you think of uh, the lessons and experiences that we can learn from uh, the development of South Africa, where you have a very powerful parliament, you have different voices across the spectrum for public opinions so when it comes to uh, the pressure uh, in a mega city like Johannesburg, where you have a serious problem of uh, law and order, uh, I mean the safety of uh, passengers there. What do you think of the um, challenges that China is facing in managing and handling so many mega cities? 
Well, I can't speak on, on behalf of China, but I can tell you that the, the importance and the relevance of what we are learning from our own young democracy, uh, having to deal with a coalition government ourselves in, in Johannesburg, is the, really the importance of listening to one another. Uh, and, and I think that one, when you are in power, and I think uh, when, when I sat on in the opposition benches for, for many years, it was so much easier if you have or felt so much easier to run a government when you are when you're in fact in in power it's so much easier to run it it's completely different when you deal with coalition government having to listen to very different voices all the time it's not about what you think you know but rather about what the other side is saying to be able to to take to take that card forward in johannesburg we are as, as a party, we are in charge of running a government with 38% of the, 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 the vote. And even our biggest coalition partner, together we wouldn't have a 50% majority. That is so critical when you want to deliver on critical infrastructure. Johannesburg being a city where we have a, a large number, a big, probably the biggest number of migrant uh, immigration figures in the country into one city. On, on, a, on a monthly basis, we're dealing with 3,000 people. 3,000 more people coming into the into crowded the city, city of Johannesburg. Coming into, into the city, which means it's more services, uh, both water and electricity. And it's so critical for us then to look at the renewable option. Because remember, it's also people coming into the city not having any form of a service. So you have to create completely new services. That new service cannot be from coal. And it's so important for us then to start with a program of renewable energy to make, uh, make use of microgrids that can then feed back into the, into, the, uh, into the energy demand. What we're looking at Johannesburg at the moment is that we've just submitted a letter to the Minister of, of, of Energy uh, to, to say to them and said to them that we want to be able to generate at least 800 megawatts from independent power producers. In Johannesburg, we prohibited to do that. Uh, or in South Africa, municipalities can't generate their own power and they can't buy from an independent uh, power producer, Eskom having the, the sole monopoly. So it makes it extremely difficult to then deliver on, in, on, on those energy demands. But critical for us, it would be to make use of our, our sunlight and renewable energy resources. Mark? We boast of a size of a population of up to 7 billion around the world, and many of them live in mega cities. And you somehow mm -hmm. represent the agenda and the voices of a C40 that mm -hmm. deals with uh, uh, mega cities. By the way, what's your definition about a mega city? Well, we took an old definition, so 3 million plus population that applies to a very large number of Chinese cities. But we have 90 of the biggest cities in the world are in C40. And what does this big number mean for the environment? for the energy and for sustainability of uh, economic development in most of the countries that host the mega cities. Well, it's interesting because these, they tend to, our members tend to be the centre of the economy in, in their nation. A quarter of world GDP is generated in these 94 uh, cities. Most of them have got populations mm -hmm. that are, are growing. All of them have got economies uh, that are growing. Mm -hmm. But the vast majority have very clearly taken the view that they cannot have sustained economic development unless they massively reduce their environmental footprint because they're just seeing that now that environmental pr pr pollution is too much of a break on economic progress both in terms of the immediate pollution the air pollution etc the pollution of rivers but then the longer term consequences which are now not so far in the future of, of climate change by the year 2049 sir it is estimated that 8 trillion will have been invested into the BRI, making it near impossible for China to solely rely on public finance. How can green financing be a key pillar uh, for the management of uh, all mega cities? I'm not just talking about BRI. We are moving from uh, BRI to a general picture of uh, uh, C40 and what job you guys do to manage the future of uh, mega cities. Nico? I think it is very, yeah, I just want to, to take one step back and be focusing on the energy aspect of it. But we should also be looking at water and sanitation. And, and Mark, you just briefly touch on it, and if I may divert 
the question a little bit. The, the, and I look again, I look at my own example. My portfolio in Johannesburg deals with water, sanitation, um, refuse, as well as, as environment and energy. The critical aspect of that is the supply of water. Now, South Africa, being one of the 50 driest countries in the world, that sounds quite scary when you think that we're living on a coastline, but we need sustainable water resources. How are we managing our water resources and then also what are we doing with our refuge, not only refuge, but also our, our refuge water, uh, sewer lines, etc. How do we treat our affluent and how can we better use that? That becomes absolutely critical because again, that can be used and better used in, 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 uh, to enable a more greener environment. So um, when it comes, then comes to the access of, of green, uh, green funding, etc., that becomes a critical role. And green funding should then be, be, be uh, a pivotal role or a pivotal part of uh, the environment that we move in. You, you, you didn't answer my question directly about where you raised the funds. Uh, green financing has mm -hmm. become a popular idea, Mark. Mm -hmm. um, do you think your organization enjoys not only understanding of uh, countries that host uh, mega cities, but also you have uh, easy access to uh, financing vehicles? Not enough. And there's, enough. There's, cl there's clearly a problem at the moment because you talk to any major fund manager and they will say there's loads of cash in the world for investing in great projects. Then you come and talk to our cities and they'll say they will struggle to find investors that will come in and invest in things that are perceived to be new. So for example, we've had mayors that have said to us they will be offered funding by multilateral banks to buy diesel buses but at a higher rate of interest if they want to buy electric buses because it's a new technology and it's not proven and they don't understand the full risk. Or we could, get, we could probably get some funding to build a massive multi-billion dollar dam. But the real problem in a city is actually that, as Nico just referred to, it's that waste isn't being properly managed. It's going into the water systems. It's blocking the drains. And, and, and far more cheaply, mm. you, could, you could reduce the problems of flooding. So I think changing the mindset of the investor community, and it, and it will require some real attention to the detail of programs that need to be carried out to make cities climate safe, and obviously there's a responsibility on cities to work better with the investment community, which is what we try and do. We try and match make between them. We have lots and lots of issues concerning the environmental protection. And one a major issue that features prominently recent years in our process of urbanization these years is uh, uh, garbage disposal. Mm. Um, we have each day tons and tons of garbage, industrial and daily life of the consumers. Um, what I'd like to have your thoughts on the um, modernized disposal of garbage uh, so that we have a healthy cycling, um, uh, reuse of the most useful resources and to make our cities look clean and we have a sense of uh, being safe. I think you need to get back, back to source on that because <coughs> there's plenty of technology for dealing with waste, managing waste, but actually the real problem is just the pure amount of stuff that we generate that is deemed to be, have no further use. It just has to be dealt with and managed away. So actually in, in C40 our calculation is you can halve the total amount of waste that's currently be gen generating in our cities by 2030. And that, that would mean having a more circular economy approach, so working with manufacturers to design products so that they have a reuse after their initial uh, use, but also of course working with consumers to have some different attitudes to things. You're seeing, you know, you're seeing this already with some of the major car companies now starting to see themselves not as selling vehicles in the future, but selling mobility. So people will buy the right to use different forms of mobility depending on, on their need. And I think that can be applied right across a, a lot of things, right through to, to clothing, perhaps, perhaps surprising things. But when you come to your question, right, to the, the end when we, there will be some waste that's left, then generally speaking, we need to be taking that organic fraction and converting it into compost or, or energy. Uh, the very small amount uh, of plastic that can't possibly be recycled, well then that probably does have to be turned in, into energy. But most of the waste can be can converted without, without that being put into landfill. It really becomes about human behaviour and how can we educate our, uh, our populations across the world to be more, to be more uh, responsible when they use 
when they use uh, waste. Uh, or when they discard up their waste. In, in Johannesburg, and, and I think it's probably across the world, but, but in Johannesburg we've got a very much diminishing uh, landfill airspace. Uh, mm. Within the next six, six years, we will have none of that left, which means that the only way we can dispose of, of, of waste would be to, to send it more than 100 kilom kilometers by rail. That's, again, it's a cost implication on the residents. So what we then have to do is not only educate our nation on, on the use of plastics, for instance, but then also what can we do, for, do with that plastic further down the line. Uh, one of our cities, uh, or towns, not cities, one of our towns is now in the process of, of building its phone first uh, plastic road. Yeah. So <laughs> that's maybe not, not a bad way to go. I wish it was Johannesburg that started with that yeah. initiative, but it's one of the coastal cities or towns will, be, will, will now be building its own first plastic road. Thank you very much. You are watching Dialogue with uh, Mark Watts, Executive Director of a C40 Cities Climate Leadership Group, and Nico De Jager, Councillor and Member of the Mayoral Committee for Environment and Infrastructure Services of Johannesburg, South Africa. We are discussing green politics, uh, uh, green behavior, and green financing that will increasingly regulate our human behavior to sustain the development. We'll be back in a short while. Stay with us. Welcome back. President Xi Jinping vows to cut our poverty population or to eliminate the poverty completely by the end of next year. Man, that's a great vision. Mm. Strong political will. Mm -hmm. Having said this, um, what do you think of uh, the embarrassment of having such a big impoverished population, particularly in the sub saharan region mm. and in many of the developing countries in Asia and Latin America? Um, what is the most important thing for tackling the issue of uh, poverty? Well, I think in, in, the, in the modern world, you know, I hate to keep bringing it back to the environmental question, but the thing that's going to drive poverty to the greatest extent in the coming years is going to be climate change because the impacts are starting to become so great. Two billion people last year affected by flooding across the year. Two billion people, a third of humanity. And the people that get hit hardest are the people who did least to cause climate change, which tends to be in the global south. And in all, com in all countries is the poorest who are, are most vulnerable to climate impacts. So actually, if you really want in the long term to tackle poverty, then it's got to be to cut emissions and prevent cat uh, climate change becoming catastrophic. But you know, I think it is an extraordinary target that President Xi is, is setting for China, and I absolutely one believes it will be achieved. You look at 70% of poverty reduction in the last 40 years in, in the world has been here in China. I think it's interesting looking around the rest of the world, though, that obviously politi poli poverty is a relative term, because even in relatively wealthy countries, people perceive themselves to be in poverty because of the disparity between their own standard of living and those of the richest. And perhaps another message here is, is really looking at how in development and including environmentally sustainable development, everybody got taken forward, not just a small part of the population being taken off at a much faster rate than everybody else. And you know, perhaps that's something one can learn the lessons of mistakes that have been made in countries like mine in the United Kingdom and avo avoid those pitfalls. Nico, despite the end of apartheid in the early 1990s, the last century, uh, ANC and other uh, uh, strong parties of the parliament uh, still find themselves facing the issue, constant issue of uh, job creation, so mm. that uh, you lessen the problem of uh, 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 social uh, safety, I mean, uh, mm. uh, law and order, uh, because of the soaring figure of unemployment in uh, most cities in mm. Africa, uh, when night falls, you have this issue of danger for passengers and for overseas mm -hmm. tourists. Uh, what will President uh, Famarosa do to make people feel safer? And, and, and I believe it also has something to do with the poverty alleviation. Yeah, absolutely, and, and again it comes back to Mark what you were just talking about, the uh, about flooding, etc. We just had massive floods in Mozambique that affected our electricity supply in Johannesburg, quite far apart, but it does. Mm -hmm. The Kahurabasa uh, electricity scheme feeds Johannesburg of almost uh, 800 megawatts of electricity. That's poverty. Uh, again, at the moment, we're facing massive cholera outbreak as a result of the flooding. 
what will President Ramaphosa do? The easiest thing would be to, to have an uh, increased public safety, but that's at a national level. In Johannesburg, what we are doing, or what we have done, is we've already started with the retraining or, or training of an additional 1,500 police officers that should be hitting the ground by the uh, middle of, of June, or end of June. So come 1st of July, we'll have an additional 1,500 Metro Police officers to look at safety security, and that is a massive problem. But not only it's not only about safety and security, it's also about the general lawlessness that comes with uh, not having sufficient uh, uh, police officers on the ground, not abiding by the rules of simple things like separation at source to deal with your, your waste. It's critical for us to deal with, with those little issues that is our bylaw enforcement our city laws need to be enforced, our traffic laws need to be enforced and we live in a society where people are pretty pretty shy when it comes to the rule of law and we need to change that and sometimes the only way to do that is by stick and that is when you need, need improved security for, for all our residents because it's true what you're saying, many of our tourists are not safe as a result of, of uh, and most of the time it's poverty. Nico, uh, both President Nelson Mandela and his uh, uh, white friend uh, F.W. de Klerk deserved credit for removing uh, racial discrimination in the early 1990s in South Africa. That's an issue of a pride for the whole uh, mankind. Having said this, uh, um, with the current discussion going on about land redistribution, uh, land reform through, of course, mm. uh, much of legislative work in the parliament, there is the constant fear of having more brain drain. Uh, whites are considering leaving this country. Mm -hmm. Do you think uh, South Africa is likely to go back and, uh, and, and fall behind other uh, developing countries in Africa? Because uh, we still have the bad legacy of uh, apartheid, uh, nonetheless, in a different way. Yeah, I think what, what one needs, one should look at the legacy of apartheid and then look at what it has done. You cannot just write the law and say apartheid is over and done with and then think that the legacy is gone. The, the reality of it is that people were born into poverty, they were raised in poverty and they continued living in poverty on the periphery of a city. Well, you have a growing army of the middle class. Uh, many Africans, I mean blacks, uh, have been real, uh, very good, uh, received very good education. So but that's still a minority of the people with access to job opportunities. Because you know, you can have all the education in the world and we have some brilliant edu edu brilliantly educated middle class black South Africans. But the majority of those people still live on the periphery on the city and without access to job opportunities, the gap will never be bridged, not fully bridged. So what we have to do is create an enabling environment that will not only give people the opportunity to get to a job opportunity, but also access that, that job opportunity. Through with what we do, uh, what we've done in Johannesburg now is to introduce free, uh, free, free transport on, on, on our public transport systems for first time job opportunities, for people accessing their jobs for the first time. Because education, I can tell you in, in South Africa, and just because what happened in 1994 was brilliant and it's beautiful and it's a prime example to the world, but the reality is that people continue, and we were having this conversation earlier, that people continue to live in a poor environment with substandard education. If government, and it's the role of government, national government to ensure that our teachers are trained properly. It starts there. Our teachers are tra trained properly and that our children, our little children, have access to good quality food enabled to grow properly. From in Johannesburg what we've been doing, and, and, and I keep on having to talk about being a politician, that's what I do, we talk about the good stuff that we are doing. We have access. We make sure that from our clinic side, we no longer have clinic hours between 8 and 4, 8 and 5 in the afternoon. We make sure that clinic hours are extended to up to 24 hours a day because clinics are there for the poor. Poor people need access to good nutrition. They need access to good medical care. Uh, unfortunately, you don't only get sick between 8 and 5. Nico, I'm afraid the issue is not just about equal access to uh, clean water 
job opportunities and education in general. But also, if they can't fix this problem, young people who are unemployed will have easy access to firearms, guns. They create problems in the streets. Uh, robberies uh, become a common place in Johannesburg. But l let me ask you, uh, Mar uh, uh, Mark a question about uh, minority rights, because the poverty of minority groups in many developing countries. Uh, even in uh, a country like Australia, back in the year 2000, when the Olympic Games were taking place, uh, local Aussies were talking about how to move uh, indigenous people from the underdeveloped uh, uh, area where they have lived uh, for centuries uh, to a more prosperous urban area. But those Aboriginal uh, tribal people refused to be relocated because mm. they love their own homeland, mm. they love the mm. ancestral land. So how difficult is it? for example, for you guys to fix the problem of uh, poverty in mega cities where you have uh, minority groups who have developed a very uh, understandable attitudes towards their cultural roots. Well, I, th I think the mayors that have most se success are the ones that really engage with their communities uh, and find ways of working together. So, I mean, all, all around the world there are slum areas that have been built in places that really are not fit for human habitation. That's the reason they weren't properly developed in the first place. But when people have built their own home, their families have perhaps lived there now for three generations, uh, they become very attached to it. And I think the idea there is not to sort of come in and bulldoze the thing down and tell everybody mm. they've got to move, but instead to go in and first of all start improving what can be improved, protecting, if it's on the side of a, you know, by a landfill, protecting from that, that landfill falling down, improving the quality of the water, and then gradually getting people engaged in the democratic mm. system, engaged in the possibility then of, of moving and building better homes elsewhere. But it's a long and a slow process, which Nico will know much better than me. It is. When you talk about the slums, slum area developing, and we call them informal settlements, I think it looks... Sound it's not just an much. issue of Johannesburg. It's also a big issue for the Indians, for the BJP, mm -hmm. the ruling party of yeah. India, the Modi administration. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, most of the BRICS economies or emerging markets mm -hmm. face much of the same problem of uh, poverty Absolutely. elevation, environmental protection, easy access to education, uh, sanitation, and Medicare. Thank you so much, gentlemen, for your participation in this meaningful issue of uh, environmental protection and sustainable development in the Asia where perhaps we globalize uh, the, the chain supply. Uh, I'll see you next time. Goodbye.